The next chapter is about a quick appraisal of the economics of mineral resource projects. Whereas quick uh, is not the correct word for the slides that are going to come. There will be some basic stuff that has to be understood or at least mentioned. And at the end of this uh, part uh, of the course I will uh, show you how uh, we do a quick uh, appraisal of the economics, a rough economic assessment if sufficient data is available. First of all, uh, minerals in the ground do not have an explicit value. Very often uh, you can read uh, something like, oh there's so much value in the ground, but there is no value in the ground. Uh, but what we do have is uh, minerals that have an opportunity value and this value comes at a cost. And the value is only created after an extractable ore body has been found and the minerals have been extracted, treated and sold to a customer. Therefore, to evaluate the value of a mineral resource, the economics of the whole mining process have to be considered. When the economic viability of a mineral resource is evaluated, there are various parameters and criteria that have to be incorporated into this ev evaluation. Yeah. Uh, a mineral resource project, uh, a resource, is needed at first, of course, and the following parameters have to be considered. The ore value of the mineral resource per ton and in total, the life of mine, or also the capacity per day, which translates in the uh, life of mine and vice versa, the mining and milling costs, the operating expenditure, and the investment amount, the capital expenditure. The economic viability is expressed by the following criteria, the payback period, the internal rate of return, and the net present value, where we will focus on. Here you can see a flow diagram of the economic viability estimations. So you have a mineral resource project and at least what you at least know, have to know, is the grade and the tonnage. The grade of the project defines the ore value and the tonnage defines the mine life or the capacity per day and this capacity directly translates into uh, the operating costs, the bigger the mine, the lower the costs, and the investment costs, the bigger the mine, the bigger the costs. And the ore value, together with the operating costs and the investment costs, uh, go into the economic estimation. And this, at the end, gives you the payback period, the NPV, and the internal rate of return. The economics of a mineral resource project are generally presented as the so-called cash flow. A cash flow comprises revenue, operating costs and capital costs. The interaction influences the project value. Here you can see the uh, cash flow magnitude which is negative during the development because you have costs but no revenue. When it comes to production the mine produces a positive cash flow and after the production has closed, you have the mine closure process, which again defines a negative cash flow. And the sum of all cash flows, of course, has to be positive to have a viable and economic uh, mineral resource.
Here you can see the cash flow elements of an operating mine. You have the positive cash flow, that is the revenues, but it's not the pure revenues. Uh, on the other hand side, you have to subtract the operating costs, um, the repayment of the capital expenditure and interest. You have to pay royalties and taxes, and these are the expenditures and the difference of the cash of the revenue minus the expenditures is the cash flow you are generating. The cash flow calculation will typically include the following sequence of inputs. So on the plus side you have the revenue you are doing with your concentrate or bouillon or whatever you are selling and you have to subtract the operating costs so mining, milling, administration and so on and also you have to subtract the treatment and refining charges and the freight costs and this gives you the operating margin and from this operating margin you have to subtract the interests until the investment loan is repaid the depreciation of all the infrastructure and uh, things you have you have to pay royalties and income taxes and the investment has to be repaid and this all together gives you the cash flow and in our case, in the quick economic appraisal, the cash flow calculation uh, considers the following inputs. So you have the revenue as a net smelter return. That means the revenue minus treatment charge, refining charge and freight costs, mining the operating costs, so mining, milling at administration. And this gives you the operating margin. From this operating margin, we are subtracting the investment until it's repaid and then we have options. We can also optional uh, subtract interests and depreciation and royalties and income taxes. We do not have information about royalties and income taxes in all cases, but if we do have this, I would suggest to include it into uh, the complete appraisal to uh, generate a cash flow that is more realistic. And to do this uh, economic appraisal we need some input parameters that are necessary. So one is the ore value of the mineral resource, one is the life of mine, the next is our mining and milling costs, so the operating expenditure, and the investment amount, the capital expenditure. The ore value is calculated by uh, taking the ore grade times the metal value times the recovery that is usually in the range of 80%. The life of mine is calculated by uh, using the tonnage of the ore you have and then you can apply a, a formula on that. One is the so-called Taylor formula but it's kind of outdated. There is new data and Mr. Long from the USGS presented a new formula how to calculate the life of mine, the optimum life of mine. And when we have uh, the life of mine and the tonnage, we can calculate the uh, ore feed per day. And this uh, daily tonnage uh, is of high importance to calculate uh, the mining and milling costs, so the operating expenditure, and also the investment amount, the capital expenditure that is needed to build the mine and then afterwards um, to run the mine. Here are some examples of the ore value of a mineral resource um, shown as a value chain. Uh, when you have a mine, one option is you have uh, direct shipping ore, so you extract the ore and directly uh, sell it to a buyer. Uh, if you have a base uh, metal ore, you will usually use uh, crushing and milling and uh, afterwards flotation to produce a concentrate and this concentrate is afterwards sold to a smelter which uh, whom you have a contract and you are getting paid for the concentrate. The smelter is smelting the ore and refining it and then afterwards selling it to uh, end users, to buyers. If you have iron ore, coal, potash or industrial minerals, you usually apply crushing, sorting and uh, separation to further concentrate the material. And 
Normally, you have a delivery contract uh, with a buyer, so you get paid by for your concentrate. If you have a precious metal ore, you can produce uh, concentrate, but uh, more frequently uh, leaching is applied. Uh, you then uh, are able to produ produce an impure metal, a bouillon, and you are selling that to a refinery, which uh, you have a contract with. So you have a refinery to contract, and you are paid for this impure metal. The refinery are, uh, afterwards is refining the precious metals, usually gold and silver, to pure gold and pure silver bars and selling it to end users, investors, whomever. So direct shipping ore, if you are selling the ore, base metals, concentrate and a smelter contract, iron ore, coal, potash, industrial minerals, usually delivery contracts, and precious metals, impure metal, and a refinery contract. In case of iron ore, the first option is you have direct shipping ore, so-called DSO. So a mine is producing a high-grade direct shipping ore of, let's say, 64% iron content, and we assume a unit price of 0.9 US dollars per DMTU, so dry metric ton unit defined below. Uh, therefore, the mine will receive 64% times 0 0.9, so $57.60 uh, per ton. In case that the mine has to process the iron ore, a mine is producing a concentrate of probably 66% iron, can be lower, can be higher, not far higher, and with a recovery of 75% uh, in this case, and the same unit price of 0 0.9, uh, the ore value is uh, lower, only 44.55 uh, uh, US dollars, as you have losses during the recovery process, which of course reduces the ore value, as the non-recoverable iron is not marketable. The ore value for non-ferrous metals, for base metals, is usually expressed as a net smelter return, the NSR. And this net smelter return is the revenue from the concentrate sales, less the transport costs, less smelting and refining charges for processing the concentrate. The net smelter return is calculated with the so-called smelter formula, which considers the grade of the concentrate, the transport costs, the TCs, the treatment charges, the losses during treatment, the refining charges, the RCs, the metal price, but also byproduct credits and deductions due to possible harmful elements like cadmium or arsenic. Here's an example of the net smelter return. You have an ore, in this case a copper ore, with a runoff mine a grade of 0.6% of copper. This ore is mined and afterwards processed to produce a concentrate with a common grade of 25 to 35% of copper, where you of course have recovery losses in the range of 10 to 30%. After processing, you have a concentrate, and this concentrate you get paid for. But uh, certain uh, things are subtracted, like in this case the sea transport, the smelting losses, the treatment charges, and the refining charges. The final product is cathode copper of 99.99%. This can be directly sold, processed, or sent to a warehouse. So you get paid for the concentrate, and afterwards, after selling, uh, leave, after the concentrate leaves the mine, the costs for transport, refining, and uh, smelting have to be reduced from the concentrate value. What you see here are typical costs for transportation. Seaborne uh, traffic is usually around uh, two US dollars 
per 1000 tons and per kilometer. If you have uh, railway transport, it's around 3 cent per kilometer and ton. And the truck is the most important, especially on the first kilometers transport, <clears throat> but also relatively expensive, around 10 US uh, cent per kilometer and ton. Uh, if you take the unit costs, you can see on the on the left hand side, iron ore is by far the cheapest. So it would not be feasible to transport iron ore via large distances by by truck. So you need a seaport that is relatively close, or you need you can also use a pipeline. The costs are not given here, or you use uh, a, a railway transport up to the next port and then you have to ship the transport over the long distances uh, usually to China can also be Europe or other destinations the other extreme in this case is gold gold has a very high uh, value per unit so it doesn't matter how to transport it it if you have 100 kilograms of gold you can send it by plane. Also, one ton would be possible to send by plane. This is not a problem. You can, of course, also use truck transport, railway transport, or ship it. But uh, the point is that it doesn't matter at, uh, for, for, the, for the unit price because the unit is very small. It's only 100 kilograms, so it doesn't matter which transport you are using. And then, due to the value and also the risk of transporting gold, it would probably be best to use a plane to directly bring it to the refinery. Other commodities with a relative high value like tantalum, tin or cobalt can also be uh, sent uh, via relatively large distances uh, by truck due to, due to the high uh, value per unit. I already mentioned a smelter contract, uh, especially for base metals. So what is a smelter contract? A smelter contract contains details that uh, concern how the mine is paid and how the mine has to deliver the concentrate. So the mine will be paid for the principal metal in the concentrate and how the mine will be credited for other desirable metals like gold, silver in the concentrate as a byproduct is also fixed in this smelter contract. Additionally, there can be penalties which uh, will be applied for materials that affect the performance of the smelter, for example, antimony, bismuth, moisture, but can also be arsenic that goes to the off gas and has to be specially treated. Other things that are uh, fixed in the smelter contract is how the delivery is to be made and how check assays. So the grade of the uh, principal metal and the byproducts uh, will be done in order to avoid problems between the mine and the smelter afterwards when they cannot uh, uh, fix how to do the assays. So this is all fixed before in the contract so you have a reliable document and everything uh, regarding the price and how to determine it is fixed in this smelter contract. And there are of course also contracts for precious metals like gold and silver, which are so-called refinery contracts. A refinery contains details uh, concerning weighing and assaying, security measures, very important for the high value of the material that is delivered, the delivery dates, the deposition of refinery waste and the transportation of the gold that's also related to security measures. Usually you have a very low grade in the ore body like several ppm and after mineral processing you're producing a doré gold of 60 to 90 percent of gold. This is done in the mine and afterwards uh, this doré goes to the refinery where 99.99 uh, .99 pure gold bars are produced. Larger mining operations sometimes have their own refineries, but the usual way for especially small and medium scale mines is to produce a doré, which is afterwards sold uh, to a refinery using a refinery contract. 
On the next slides, I will give an example how to calculate the net smelter return for an example of a copper, gold and zinc mine. There is a is nobody that is mined, the, the ore is crushed and afterwards milled and after milling it is flotated into two different concentrates. A copper concentrate sold to smelter A and a zinc concentrate sold to smelter B. So the net smelter return has to be calculated for the copper concentrate and also for the zinc concentrate. Here we see the information we need about the mine. It's a mine, a small mine, that is processing 275,000 tons of ore per year. The grades are 2.3% of copper, 2.6 grams per ton of gold and 5.7% of zinc. Uh, the mine is producing a copper concentrate uh, with a concentrate grade of 21% of copper and 19.9 .9 grams per ton of gold. The mill recovery into this copper concentrate is 85% for copper and 73% for gold. The zinc con uh, concentrate contains 6.7 uh, grams per ton of gold and 53% of zinc with a very high recovery for zinc of 90% and 15% for gold. With the recovery and the concentrate grade, uh, we know that the mine is producing almost 26,000 tons of copper concentrate with a copper content of 5,400 tons. The metal uh, per ton is 21%, so 200 and, uh, 210 kilograms of copper per ton of concentrate that are 463 pounds. Uh, during the smelting process there are losses. These are deducted and that is 23 pounds. So we have a payable metal for copper of 440 pounds and we have a very low price in this case but you can change as you like uh, if you want to make your own calculation. And with a metal price of $1.50 per pound, uh, we have a metal value for copper of 660 US dollars per ton. And uh, for gold, it's um, almost the same amount price. We have uh, almost 20 grams, but we have deductions, 2.5 uh, grams per ton. So payable metal is 17.5. And with a metal price, a gold price of 925 US dollars per ounce, we have 520 US dollars per ton as a byproduct credit. On the other hand side, we also have uh, treatment and refining charges. The treatment charges are 75 US dollars per ton of concentrate. We also have transport costs of 34 US dollars per ton of concentrate and not only transport but also loading and representation costs of 5 US dollars. So the total deductions in this case are 114 US dollars per ton of concentrate. Additionally, there are refining charges. These are 0 0.075, so 7.5 uh, cent per pound of copper. Additional 33 US dollars per ton of concentrate. So the value of copper after deduction and refining is 513 US dollar per ton of concentrate. As the deductions for uh, treatment charges, transport and so on are only applied once, it, they are not applied for um, the gold value. So gold is only the refining charges that are subtracted. These are 6 US ounces, uh, dollars per ounce. As we have half an ounce, it's only three dollars. So the concentrate value for gold is 517 US dollars per ton of concentrate. So the complete value of the concentrate is 1,030 US dollars per ton of concentrate, uh, and you can recalculate it uh, to an ore value that is then in the range of 105 to 110 US dollars per ton of ore, only taking the copper 
concentrate. The price for zinc is uh, substantially lower than for copper. It's only 70 US cent per pound. Uh, but uh, the grade is higher. It's 530 kilogram of zinc per ton of concentrate or 1169 pounds. There are deductions that are higher compared to copper of 175 pounds. So payable metal is 993 pounds. The treatment charges are also slightly higher uh, in case of zinc compared to, to copper and as the smelter is further away, the transport costs are higher. So the total de uh, deductions are 280 US dollars per ton of concentrate. That translates to a value after deduction and refining of 450 US dollars per ton of concentrate and a little byproduct credit but we do not we do not have the amount of uh, gold compared to the copper concentrate so we have additional 85 US dollars so altogether 500 US dollars per ton which translates to almost uh, an additional ore value of uh, 50 US dollars per ton of ore so we have the 105 US dollars from the copper concentrate and additionally uh, almost 50 dollars from the zinc concentrate per ton of ore. So where does the money come from at the end of the day? $48 per ton of ore are derived from copper. Uh, $56, $50 are from gold and zinc gives $40 uh, per ton of ore. So the whole net smelter return per ton of ore is almost 145 US dollars. That is the price that the mine will receive for processing, mining, transporting, minus uh, all charges that are applied, minus transport for one ton of ore. The mine will receive a net smelter return of $144.76 in this case. I know that the metal prices for copper, for gold, but also for zinc are higher nowadays so the value per ton will also be higher uh, I did not change this because it is not important for this particular example you can do your own calculations with your own data to see what would be the net smelter return an additional factor is that although prices were rising transport costs and also treatment and refining charges are relatively stable meaning that with a higher price for your commodity the percentage of deduction for transport treatment and refining is lower nowadays than it was with lower metal prices so the net smelter return in percentage is higher with a higher metal price for the calculation of the net smelter return you can also use a rule of thumb uh, that can be uh, used for a quick appraisal. The net smelter return can then be calculated as follows. The ore grade in percent, grams per ton or ounces per ton. Um, you can include, if necessary, mining dilution, which would reduce the ore grade. And then you can apply a percentage of the revenue for the mine as a net factor. You have to include the percentage of mill recovery and the mineral commodity price on a long term, let's say 10 years or probably 5 years are enough average. But uh, as you could see in the slides above, it looks on the first view a little complicated, but actually it's not. You can always calculate the net smelter return uh, based on data you have. You can calculate uh, the concentrate grade, you can calculate uh, or you have data from assays of the concentrate grade or byproducts you do have and you can more or less have a rough idea about the distance to the next smelter if you use uh, a truck or if you can use a uh, railroad that is of course of importance uh, to the transport costs but you usually have the information and you can use this information so you can use the rule of thumb but you can also use an eye I would suggest to do it. I would suggest to do a 
proper calculation because it's just more exact and you have a, a lower error uh, at the end of the calculation. Here you can see or you have an overview about the net smelter return of uh, final product value. So in uh, case of copper you have cathode copper, for zinc it's the same, for lead. And um, here the net smelter return is given in a, as a percentage of the cathode materi material and it's said that it's for copper it's around uh, 65 to 75 percent but it can be as written here as high as 90 percent and that depends on uh, the actual metal price if you have a low metal price like one dollar twenty one dollar fifty per pound of copper uh, the smelter return will only be 63 percent or 65 percent but if you have a high metal value like three pounds uh, at three dollars per pound of copper you will have a far higher uh, smelter return of uh, around 90 percent and this is the same for copper for zinc for lead for nickel for tin it should be even higher because the the metal value is higher and that is also reflected here in a higher and that's smelter return given and a shorter range of fluctuation fluctuation molybdenum on the other hand side due to very low recoveries or lower recoveries has a lower smelter return and the smelter returns for gold as a byproduct and also as a, a main product are uh, always far higher compared to copper as the value of the end product is far higher uh, in this case compared to base metals. On this slide you can see how the rule of thumb on the net smelter return for this copper gold zinc mine is applied and uh, at the end uh, the calculated uh, net smelter return using the rule of thumb is $138 relatively close to the calculated uh, value of 145 US dollars but uh, I would like to stress um, that especially in case of copper, uh, we here get a result of uh, $42.40 using the rule of thumb. When you compare that to the calculated value of $48, you already have a difference of 12%. Yeah, uh, Together with zinc and gold, the difference is not so big. But if you take only copper, the difference is there. And it is especially there when you uh, do not use a price of $1.50 per pound, but, is for example, $3. Because then what is happening is that you have a higher value of the concentrate and you have a higher net smelter return uh, on a percentage. Yeah, And if you would use uh, the same formula, but using $3 of copper, you would have a difference of the rule of thumb uh, smelter return to the calculated smelter return of 23 percent. Yeah, so you can use the rule of thumb, but I would really uh, like you to take the time, to take the five minutes to sit down and calculate the more exact net smelter return using the data you have. If you do not have the data, fine, then you cannot change it, but if you have the data, use the time, sit down and calculate the net matter return. If you have uh, polymetallic uh, deposits, in like this case, copper, gold, zinc, or also a uh, copper mine with a gold uh, credit, or a gold mine with a silver credit, uh, mines tend to give the metal equivalent value. Uh, this is done because it's more easy. It's uh, you can. It's easier to imagine how how high the the real metal grade is. Yeah, it's it's easier than saying yeah we have two percent copper and uh, seven percent zinc and we have some gold. So all the the value on in this case on the net matter return basis uh, is taken and uh, recalculated from back. You have the value and you have the copper uh, uh, price you need to use the conversion factor from ton to pound 
or from in this case from pound to ton and if you calculate backwards you result um, copper equivalent grade of 4% you could also uh, calculate this on a zinc uh, basis using the metal price of zinc of 70 cent per pound and you would result a zinc equivalent grade of 9% you could of course also calculate this for gold basis but gold here is only the byproduct gold is in the crystal lattice of uh, charcoal pyrite and is also contained in the zinc minerals so uh, here you see how this equivalent grade calculation is done you need the value of the ore and then you can recalculate this on the basis of one metal to the equivalent grade as we talked about prices how are commodity prices determined yeah that depends on the commodity um, there's the option one you have producer prices so the producers that the price this is common for industrial uh, minerals but it all of course depends on the market situation yeah if you have only one producer it can set the price if you have a lot of producers in a competing environment probably not the producer sets the price but the buyer sets the price that depends on the market condition of this particular commodity the second option is that the prices are set uh, at commodity exchanges so the prices are determined by independent bodies which are neither buyer nor direct seller of the mod metal The third option is that the prices are directly negotiated. So the pricing is determined between the buyer and the seller. Often long-term contracts for metals or concentrates are used. So both buyer and seller have a security about the price in the near to medium term uh, future. Base metal prices are usually fixed uh, at commodity exchanges so the prices are determined by transactions between dealers on an exchange such such as the London Metal Exchange or the New York Mercantile Exchange the prices are either spot prices that means that the price that is quoted for the immediate settlement for the spot settlement or their forward future prices predetermined delivery price to be paid at predetermined date in the future the London uh, metal exchange uh, has prices for aluminium copper lead nickel zinc and tin and the New York trade exchange fixes prices for aluminium copper gold silver platinum and palladium precious metals market are sometimes or well, not so sometimes often uh, traded over the counter so at least if you are not a small scale miner and you have to buy to a middleman that is by uh, selling to someone else and then this guy is exporting but we are talking about uh, bigger mines and we are talking about uh, the fixum of prices for gold bars so one big um, market is the London Bouillon Market Association where especially gold and silver is traded. The members meet twice daily to review offers from worldwide sources to buy and sell gold and silver. The results averaged and are averaged and announced as the official AM in the morning and PM afternoon fixings for each of the two metals and can be found on the London Bouillon Market website London uh, is also trading platinum and palladium as in New York uh, it works similar to the uh, gold and silver London bouillon market but it's of course for platinum and palladium and the prices are uh, published on the London platinum and palladium market website
The big question is how are prices established? Uh, the theory is very simple. It's like supply and demand. When the demand rises and the supply remains short, the prices are rising. On the other hand side, if the supply rises and the demand stays the same, the prices will go down because there's just too much material in the market. Especially uh, for, for raw materials, for commodities, they're usually or there have been in the past uh, a lot of cycles. Yeah, the prices go up and uh, the demand is, is rising uh, but on the other hand side the supply uh, cannot uh, keep the pace with the uh, need in demand. Why is this? Because the mining projects usually have a very long lead time. That means the time until they go into production. It is not possible to switch on or switch off a mine. If you have shut down a mine it takes time to re-establish it to bring it back to production and it of course takes much more time to have a pro uh, if you have a project in the feasibility stage in the pre-feasibility stage to get to feasibility and construction. So when prices go up due to increased demand the demand will follow but it will follow some time after so the prices go up and then the demand is following and this after the demand has been increased the supply is increasing and in a certain time the supply will reach the demand or even uh, be a little higher than the demand and this in turn reduces the prices. So this is a typical cyclical uh, behavior of raw materials and the last cycle, the so-called super cycle, was something special because the prices went up and went up and did not go down uh, be just because of the huge demand that came from China and this was something new, such a big economy uh, with such a big need for uh, raw materials. In former times uh, the main demand came from Europe and North America but this has now uh, changed and the main demand for most commodities is coming from China. China is not only the biggest producer of raw materials worldwide but also the by far biggest consumer. So when it's about pricing for raw materials China is uh, the main driver of these uh, of prices in general. So if China has a big demand the prices will rise. If the demand from China is decreasing the demand will decrease and also the will the prices. There can be uh, other things like uh, influencing uh, the prices very much like the uh, demand for lithium-ion uh, batteries and the commodities for these lithium-ion batteries. So we saw a price increase especially for lithium and for cobalt in the years 2018 and uh, also 19. But the prices already went down again because especially for lithium a lot of new mines uh, opened increasing the demand so the prices went down sharply. Um, after this peak in 2018. When you have a uh, reserve in the ground uh, you will of course now have to estimate what is the optimum daily production or the optimum annual uh, production for this reserve. And you can determine this uh, by uh, having a look on other mines because there usually is an optimum of production uh, that then translates in uh, the life of mine and the larger the reserve the larger of course also the the daily processing and the faci processing facility in general but also the larger the, the reserves the longer is the life of mine and this can be calculated by certain formulas that I will show you in the next slide. So again you have an optimum mine life and an optimum daily production that will give you an optimum um, operating expenditure and also an optimum 
investment, so capital expenditure. If you want to do an economic assessment in an early stage of uh, your mining project, um, you already know the resources or the reserves in tons in the ground and now you have to calculate the capacity per day and the life of mine. And this can be calculated by empirical uh, formulas. Uh, in former times we used the formula of uh, Taylor from 1986, but in 2009 uh, Mr. Long from the USGS uh, calculated uh, or presented a new approach to uh, better um, assume uh, the daily uh, capacity. And he differentiates between open pit and block caving operations on the one hand side and underground operations on the other hand side. And the daily capacity can be calculated by the formulas you can see below. And as mentioned in former times, we used here in the BGR the formula of Taylor, Taylor but uh, when having a look on the nowadays installed capacity, uh, we took the, the data of long and re-evaluated uh, the data of long and we have to see that it still seems to be um, the best rule of thumb to estimate daily capacity. So one is open pit and block having and the other one is underground capacity. This is substantially different especially for for uh, bigger tonnages uh, you will see one in one of the next slides how the daily capacity is changing with increasing capacity uh, tonnage having the total resources or reserves tonnage in the ground the capacity per day and the life of mine can be calculated with the help of the formula of Mr. Long from 2009. Uh, this formula differentiates between open pit and block caving on the one hand side and underground operations, as can be seen on the formula on the slide. Uh, previously, the formula of Taylor from 1986 was used to calculate the daily tonnages and capacities you can also see the formula on this slide. But data from today's mining projects uh, showed that nowadays installed uh, capacity better fits when applying the formula of long. So we suggest to use this formula when calculating uh, daily capacities and life of mine. Here you can see a diagram of the reserves in million tons uh, on the one hand side and the daily capacity on the other side. And uh, long differentiates between open pit with a substantially higher capacity per day and underground mines. The reason for this is that you can uh, exploit an open pit from all directions, whereas you are quite limited in uh, the approach and the, the mining of an underground deposit. So you are not as free as you are compared to open pit mining and that is why the daily capacity is usually uh, far lower. Uh, the formula of Taylor gives, an, gives a value that is somehow in between but it's not differentiating between open pit and underground mining and that is one of the big advantages of the, of the formula of, of Long uh, which is yeah, simply uh, more precise. As a quick result, you can say, one can say Long predicts higher daily tonnages, especially for open pits and small underground mines below 15 million tons, and uh, for, for, for bigger tonnages um, the underground mines uh, have a lower tonnage, but the open pits still uh, have a far higher tonnage compared to the data from Taylor. The size and the depth of the deposit influences the operating costs as well as the amount of investment. The operating costs and the investment amount depend principally on the mining method, so if it's underground or open pit mining, although you have very different 
types of underground uh, uh, mining with different costs and open pit mining where you have big differences between uh, different waste to all ratios. It also, of course also depends on the milling me method, so on the processing you, you apply and of course the size of, a, of the operation uh, is of importance. The bigger the size, uh, the lower are the unit costs, the so-called economies of scale. So the selection of the mining method um, at the end uh, of the day is uh, decisive for the costs you have, but uh, you cannot simply choose the mining method you would prefer. You have to adjust uh, the mining method to the ore body. You cannot adjust the ore body to the mining method. Yeah, So the ore body usually dictates the mining method. Everybody would like to do open pit mining with a, with a low waste to ore ratio, but uh, it depends simply on the geometry of the ore body, on the position of the ore body, and it of course also um, depends on the on the host rock. Yeah? For example, uh, the, the waste to ore ratio is also dictated by the final pit slope. Yeah? How steep is it possible to build the slope? But it's, it's of course not possible to, to build a slope with 90 uh, degree. This is, this is impossible. You will have 45 or probably, if you are lucky, 60 degree. And also for the, for the mining method, um, it depends on the thickness of the ore body. It depends on the competence of the horse truck and of the of the ore. So there are very very uh, many variables that have to be considered uh, during the selection of the mining method. And depending on on the ore body, here you can see uh, a diamond uh, deposit in most probably uh, Canada. Uh, you can see. Uh, that the mining method can can change depending uh, on the ore also yeah you have a very steep pipe steeply dipping uh, uh, pipe and uh, as it crops out at the surface you will use open pit mining in the beginning but uh, at the later uh, stage of the mine of mining you will have to uh, change open pit mining to underground mining because if you don't uh, the waste to ore ratio will would simply be too big. So at a certain uh, marginal cut, uh, not cut off, but uh, waste to ore ratio, uh, underground mining is simply cheaper than open pit mining. And then it depends on the ore value. If you can apply this underground mining method, if the uh, the ore value is not high enough, you have to stop mining. And if you are lucky and the ore uh, value is high enough you can apply apply uh, underground mining, um, in this uh, case uh, sub-level stoping, which is also uh, not so expensive, but for sub-level stoping you need uh, an ore body with a sufficient thickness, for example, and competent uh, host rock. Additionally, you can see here different elements uh, of a mine layout. Yeah? Uh, like like a shaft or an edit, you can also use edit entry depending on the on the circumstances. You have uh, abandoned levels, you have active mining levels, and you have uh, uh, preparation of new uh, levels in the underground uh, mining operation. On this slide, you can see four different uh, mining methods for underground mining. On the top left, you can see room and pillar. Or which is usually applied uh, for seam-like uh, deposits. You have a high selectivity, a low ore dilution, but you do have mining losses due to the pillars you have to leave in the ground. You can try to recover the pillars at the end of mining, but you will have losses. You have good operating costs, plus minus good investment costs. The productivity can be very high. Uh, on the right, on the top right, you have uh, block caving. You can only apply block caving if you have a massive ore body. You have to undercut this ore body, and due to the collapsing uh, uh, collapse of the ore body above, the, the the rock mass is also uh, breaking down, and you can uh, take it out um, as um, 
yeah, as you can see on the image. You have a low selectivity, you have a high ore dilution, you have mining losses, but on the other hand side, you have very low operating costs, you have a high investment, but on the other hand side, you have a very, very high productivity comparable to, to open pit mining, and that is why uh, Mr. Long decided to bring together open pit and block caving methods on the one hand side and all the other underground mining methods on the other hand side. On the lower left you can uh, see cut and fill mining. This is applied for relatively narrow veins with a, uh, with a high ore value. You have a very good selectivity, very low ore dilution, very low mining losses, but you have very high operating costs. So you can only apply this when the ore value is high enough. Now the investment costs are not very high and the productivity is relatively low, but this is of course also due to the uh, narrow ore body. On the right hand side you have also a vein, but in this case you can apply sublevel stoping because uh, the thickness of the vein is by far bigger compared to cut and fill, and, of, and the, the, the host rock is also of importance. If you apply sublevel stoping, you have an average selectivity, average ore dilution, average mining losses, relatively low operating costs, average investment, but on the other hand you have a high productivity and uh, very good uh, operational health and uh, safety conditions. On this slide you can see size and costs of different underground mining methods. Now, if you start, we start with cut and fill mining or shrinkage uh, mining. You have usually relatively low uh, productivity of 200 to 2000 uh, tons per day and uh, high operating costs. And this is due to uh, the nature of the deposits that are milled, uh, mined with this method. Usually narrow veins are mined and these veins on the other hand side have a high ore value. So you can selectively mine high grade areas. When you apply end slice mining, vertical crater retreat or sub-level stoping, you will have higher typical ranges of production between 800 and 8000 tons uh, per day. Uh, and you will also have uh, lower operating costs uh, at comparable to slightly higher um, investment costs. But you can only apply these mining methods if you have an ore body that is suitable for end slice, vertical crater retreat or sub-level stoping method. Yeah? So you need an ore body which of sufficient size and especially sufficient thickness. All mentioned uh, mining methods, cut and fill, shrinkage, end slice, vertical crater retreat and sub-level uh, stoping uh, can only be applied for steeply dipping ore deposits. On the other hand side you have uh, room and pillar mining that is that can only be applied uh, for seam-like deposits. So for coal, for potash, uh, also for any deposit that has a seam-like uh, extension, you can uh, mine the ore, but you have to leave certain pillars that support the roof. Uh, you can have very high uh, productivity in room and pillar up to 14,000 uh, tons per day, and you usually have a relatively low operating cost, but high investment. Considering uh, productivity, sublevel caving and especially block caving have the highest, by far highest uh, productivities uh, as in capacity per day and also especially block caving the lowest operating costs. On the other hand side you of course also uh, have to prepare the ore body uh, for the caving method and this is cost intensive and this is why the capital investment for sublevel caving, or again, especially for block for block caving, is extremely high. So this is only suitable for large ore bodies. 
the selection of the processing method, the milling method, uh, is usually dictated by uh, the ore minerals you have. Uh, if you have tin, tantalum, or also coarse gold, uh, you are able uh, to apply density sorting, which is relatively cheap. Or you can, uh, especially for gold, uh, fine gold, and also uh, for oxide copper, you can leach the ore. The costs of leaching are then dictated uh, by the consume of acid in case of uh, copper or uh, cyanide for gold. And uh, the consumption depends on other minerals that uh, uh, are on the leaching pad. So if you have a very high consumption of acid or cyanide, um, this processing method or this ore body might not be uh, feasible uh, for this uh, processing method. On the slide you can see here there's a typical uh, flotation circuit. So you have a mine and an ore on the, on the waste rock will be put on the waste rock dump and you have to care for the waste water. The ore is then crushed, grinded with the addition of a lot of water, on average one to two cubic meters per ton of ore. And afterwards the separation process begins, in this case flotation. After milling you ca could also uh, um, apply gravity sorting. Uh, after the, the flotation process you have a concentrate which you have to dewater on the one hand side and the grow of the uh, the ore is going to the tailings, to the tailings management facility from which you can recycle some water to the grinding circuit and you're also already also producing wastewater which has to be treated. So you have the mineral processing in one uh, stream from top to bottom but you're also generating uh, waste rock and tailings and you have to care about uh, the water the wastewater from the tailings and the wastewater that is generated, uh, not generated from the waste rock, but this is, which is going through the waste rock and can contain a certain amount of um, harmful elements. And if so, the wastewater has to be treated in a manner that you can uh, either use it for your processing or you can discard it safely to the next uh, river. So when a feasibility study is done, usually all costs uh, con in, are considered for the operating expenditure and for the capital expenditure. What we do is a very quick uh, economic assessment and so our operating expenditure and capital expenditure includes labor, consumables, energy, water, the environmental management and administration and the capital expenditure includes mine and mill equipment, the main roads on your site, the waste rock facility and the tailings management facility. What our evaluation does not include are access roads, railroads if needed, power lines to the mine uh, and uh, closure and reclamation because this um, you don't have general costs for this. This is um, highly depending on where you are and uh, in, what uh, in which circumstances, in which environmental conditions your mine uh, is located. So this is clearly a modifying thing here. We talked about modifying factors before and is, as access road, railroad, power and water and closure reclamation for this you do not have model costs because uh, they, are, they are not typical costs for, for a mine. You have a high variation of these costs so these, they are not included here. So if you really want to compare different mines or mine sites you can do or you have to do um, the economic assessment also using roots of thumb in an early stage, but you also have to consider 
the cir the circumstances where your your mine is located because you will have very different costs for access for railroad power closure reclamation and so on uh, the cost will be very different if you are on the on the on a flat land on the one hand side or in a steeply steep mountain uh, environment uh, probably additionally in the naturally protected area so operating costs for uh, mining and milling for for this you have so-called on-site costs to to mine and to concentrate the mineral resource the mining costs depend on the project type so either underground and then the underground mining method and open pit mining uh, in case of open pit you have different ways to all ratios which uh, highly influence the costs of mining. This has to be taken into account. And for milling, the costs you have costs to produce a mineral concentrate from the ore. And both of course are highly uh, both costs are uh, dependent on the size of the operation. The bigger the size, the lower the operating costs. On this chart you can see barriers for for mining operations in uh, in case of operating expenditure uh, because they this depends on the depth and the way to all ratio in green you can just it's just uh, two examples of of revenues uh, you can you can generate from two mining operations uh, the revenue is uh, always the same it's not changing with depth because we assume that the ore body is homogeneous and has a certain or value. What is not um, constant are the mining costs. With depth the mining costs will change and they will increase because you you will increase when you do open pit mining you will increase your waste to all ratio and this substantially influences the operating costs. The costs are also the uh, influenced for underground mining so the deeper you go the more expensive mining will be because just one thing uh, the 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 edit or the or the shaft will be will be deeper and this of course also increases the cost and you have to transport the ore from deeper to the surface which also increases the costs the difference between open pit uh, mining costs and underground mining costs is that the open pit mining costs have a steeper incline in costs uh, when the waste to ore ratio increases. In contra in, in in on the contrary, the underground mining costs also increase, but by far not that steep like open pit mining does. So uh, in case of example A, you can only apply open pit mining up to the depth that is indicated by line A. Underground mining is not feasible because the costs are higher uh, than the revenue you will get from your ore. Line B shows where underground mining begins to be more economical than open pit mining. So if your ore body is uh, large enough, uh, there's still enough reserve, you can think about changing from open pit to underground mining because from this point it is cheaper. The line C indicates from where open pit mining is no longer feasible if you have an ore with a revenue 2 and line D indicates the depth from, wi uh, from which on also underground mining is no more feasible and the mining should stop when you have reached this depth. Here you can see different uh, model costs for, for open pit mining for different ways to all ratios from 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 4 to 1 and 8 to 1. The model does not give uh, more examples but I think it's already sufficient. So um, when you have the tonnage and you can uh, calculate the life of mine and the daily capacity you can you have the optimum capacity so uh, per day and then you have to see okay what do I have for a waste to ore ratio? This 
you have to calculate on your own based on the location of the and the geometry of the ore body and then you can see okay what are the mining just the mining costs if you have let's say uh, 1000 tons per day mining operation and you apply have a waste to ore ratio of one to one you have probably uh, mining costs of 12 dollars on the other hand side you have costs of 30 dollars per ton if you have a waste to ore ratio of eight to one so we have very high differences uh, depending on your waste to ore ratio here you can see again as i showed before already for for underground mining uh, typical ranges of uh, mining and milling costs in terms of operating expenditure milling costs for surface open pit mining are usually in the range of uh, five to thirty dollars but highly depending on the waste to ore ratio and additionally on the size of your operation underground mining is usually between twenty and one hundred dollars and the milling costs are of course the same for open pit or underground mining this only depends on uh, what deposit you have what minerals you have and the milling costs shown here are 10 to 25 of course have a far higher range if you have a very big deposit the, the, the milling costs uh, can be as low as five US dollars uh, but can also be as high as 150 or 200 dollars if you have a very very small deposit and so a very small uh, processing fa facility the data is taken from from InfoMine uh, to be able to calculate uh, to use the model costs and to calculate uh, the economic or to do the economic assessment depending on the rock mass stability uh, you have different uh, ways to all ratios in open pit mining uh, and you can see why is this this is clearly illustrated by by the sketch below um, if your rock mass only allows uh, you to have a, a pit slope a final pit slope of 45 degree the pit is of course not as steep as it is if you uh, are able to apply a final apply a final slope angle of 60 degree uh, in this case the depth uh, of mining is 90 meters in both cases and uh, the ore tonnage of the ore body until this depth is uh, 4 million tons uh, but you have uh, different waste to ore ratios uh, at, at uh, uh, 90 meters depth the average waste to ore ratio in uh, example 1 with 45 degree is 1.27 to 1 and if you can apply a steeper slope you have an average waste to ore ratio of 1 to 1 and this is not the only important thing you also have to consider the marginal waste to ore ratio uh, which is 2 to 1 on the left hand side and w only 1.8 to 1 on the right hand side and why is this important this marginal uh, waste to ore ratio it is of importance because due to the ore value you have a maximum viable marginal waste to ore ratio in this case from this ore of 3.7 to 1 and the steeper the slope is the lower is the waste to ore ratio and the deeper you can mine and this of course uh, leads to a higher reserve and you can exploit more ore on the one hand side have a higher revenue and on the other hand side you can apply a bigger processing facility and uh, bigger machinery during the exploitation because you have simply have a higher reserve and this is additionally cost decreasing so it's always advantages of course to have a steep uh, slope but this uh, is dictated not uh, by, by some guesses but from the rock mass stability when we are calculating or estimating uh, the net present value and the viability of a mining project in a very early stage uh, at least I do prefer to use uh, 
model costs, but uh, this is not necessarily the only uh, possibility to do it, uh, to estimate the required initial investment, so the capital costs. Um, you can also try to find similar projects, whereas the question is what is similar, um, and use uh, the, uh, the, the, the capital that has been uh, spent there. And based uh, on a similar project, uh, Mr. O'Hara uh, invented a rule of 0 0.6. That means uh, you use the capital expenditure from, an, from a similar project and then uh, divide your capacity by the capacity of the similar project um, times uh, 0 0.6. Six, not times 0 0.6, but uh, uh, with an exponent 0 0.6. And Mr. O'Hara said in 1980 that this also gives more or less the capital expenditure you need. But you have to be careful because you uh, have to be aware that usually uh, prices are increasing. So you should um, also incorporate uh, inflation rate to increase the capital costs. You can do that, although the, the rule is uh, already 40 years old, but as I said, we I do prefer to use model costs. If you don't have the model costs, you can try uh, to use uh, this rule, but I would uh, ask you to, to try uh, if if this rule is applicable in, uh, in the region where you are, you can try this uh, with other Mm, with other uh, mining projects that are active in, in your region. Probably it fits, and if it fits, you can apply it. If not, please try to use uh, model costs if possible. So here's an example how to apply the 0 0.6 rule of uh, Mr. O'Hara. So to estimate the capital expenditure for, in this case, an antimony uh, concentrator, which has the capacity of 130, uh, 180,000 tons per year. Uh, for comparison, you have the capital expenditure of an antimony concentrator plant that had a cost of 20 million US dollars with a capa capacity of 125,000 tons per year. So you take the 20 million dollars, you take the 100,000 tons divided by 125,000 and use the um, exponent 0 0.6. That gives um, capital expenditure of 25 million US dollars. And uh, as you have an exponent, um, you have, don't have a linear uh, relation. Um, the costs are only 25% higher uh, for a concentrator that has a capacity which is tw uh, around 40 to 50 percent higher. So as I said, you can use it. It's probably applicable, but you should check if it is applicable in the region where you are. So here's a little exercise concerning the rule of O'Hara. Uh, you would like to estimate the capital expenditure for a tungsten concentrator, which has the capacity to process 2.5 million tons of light or per year and what you do have is a comparable tungsten concentrator uh, which costs costed 70 million US dollars and has a capacity of 1.1 million tons of light ore so you have to can take the 70 million and have to multiply the 70 million uh, with the um, with the capacity you would like to have, so 2.5 divided by 1.1, and the conversion, uh, the, the factor is then 2.7. You have to uh, insert um, the exponent of 0 0.6, so the conversion factor is 1.6. So 70 million US dollars times 1.6 is around 114 million US dollars. So this, according to the rule of O'Hara, uh, would then be the uh, expected capital expenditure for your processing facility.
So another uh, possibility to have a very broad approximation of the capital uh, expenditure is if you do not have the possibility to compare your project with other projects or you do not have the possibility to use model costs, yeah, you can uh, try to uh, approximate the capital expenditure by a model given from, from Western Mine uh, Engineering. Uh, they say the capital expenditure per ton of end product you have to multiply with the annual mill capacity which then would give you the initial capital expenditure. Um, yeah, uh, Western Mine Engineering uh, published something in 1998 and they say typical costs for capital expenditure mm, are 70 to, U to 200 US dollars for surface mines and 100 to 300 dollars for underground mines. This is very broad, very broad. And additionally, uh, one has to see that, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the last years, in the last 10 years, um, the capital expenditure uh, did rise substantially per ton of, of material uh, because the ore grades uh, were declining. So a lot more investment had to be done in order to produce um, a certain amount of end product. So I would uh, suggest only to use it if there are no other possibilities. Uh, so by the way, where does the capital expenditure go to? And this uh, is highly dependent uh, if you have an open pit or an underground mine and whether the infrastructure is already available or not. On the left hand side you can see an open pit uh, mine infrastructure, infrastructure is required and the throughput is 85,000 tons uh, per day. Capital expenditure 1.1 billion US dollars. So one fifth goes to a mine, the other fifth goes to the uh, processing plant, uh, but 27% uh, go to infrastructure and 19% to administration with a contingency of 13%. Uh, uh, on the right hand, say, uh, right hand side, you, we have an underground mine with available infrastructure and a far lower throughput of only 11,000 tons per day. Investment costs are 500 million US dollars. And you can see that uh, contingency and administration is relatively similar to the open pit. Uh, but due to the available infrastructure, the amount spent here is by far lower. The processing plant is 17%, comparable to uh, the open pit, but the difference here uh, is clearly the mine, where 45% of the costs go to the mine. And this is not only because the infrastructure was already available. This is because uh, the preparation work for an underground mine is by far higher compared to an open pit mine. Yeah, most things are similar, contingency, administration, and uh, also the processing plant. But the investment for uh, at, the, at the underground mine is for the mine. And... Uh, this is, of course, in contrast to the open pit. What you can see here, see here is the capital uh, expenditure behavior uh, with increasing uh, operational size. So the more uh, ore is produced daily, of course, the higher are the investment costs. But uh, O'Hara gave uh, in his um, formula, in his rule of thumb, uh, an exponent of 0 0.6 and uh, using model costs with newer with later data so the data from the from the last years um, we cannot see that yeah it it seems to be quite linear and uh, even for 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 the biggest mines here with 100,000 uh, tons per day uh, the costs even seem to rise again so you do not have lower investment costs, relatively lower investment costs per ton uh, of, of ore processed. 
uh, you do not have the economies of scale here. You will or you do have the economies of scale uh, when you uh, see the operating costs. They are decreasing, 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 but also only um, to, a, to a maximum level. Yeah? The decrease is especially uh, in, in the beginning when you go to 1,000, 2,000, uh, probably 10,000 tons. But then the difference between 50,000 and 80,000 tons is not that big anymore. We have talked now about life of mine, operating expenditure and capital expenditure. And now let's have a look on a concrete example. So what is the life of mine, what is the operating expenditure and what is the capital expenditure of a tin mine that will be developed based on a mineral resource of 12.5 uh, million tons. The operation uh, is 350 days per year running and the mine is planned as an open pit with a waste to ore ratio of 2 to 1 including a concentration, so a flotation plant producing cassiterite concentrate and uh, the example or the exercise now is to estimate the OPEX and the CAPEX uh, and the following steps uh, need to be done. So first of all we have to calculate the life of mine and the daily ore production feed. Second, we uh, have to consult the cost regression curves based on InfoMine shown in the slides before and we have to apply uh, an inflation factor. But the inflation uh, factor is more optional. First of all it is uh, important to calculate the life of mine and the daily ore feed to be able to uh, go into the regression curves to estimate the OPEX and the CAPEX and uh, based on that we can afterwards calculate um, yeah, the economies of this uh, potential mine. So first of all we have to apply the formula of long which is 0.123 times reserves or resources to the power of 0.65 and uh, in this case we have 12.5 million tons and th this gives us an annual throughput of around 5,000 tons per day for an open pit operation. So 5,000 tons of ore plus 10,000 tons of uh, waste in this case. And so we will have a life of mine of around 7 years. And if we now go into the cost curves, uh, we will see that uh, we will have an operating uh, expenditure for around 7 uh, million uh, US dollars for mining and additional 12 million ton, uh, US dollars for milling. And the capital expenditure will be around uh, 20 million US dollars for the mining and 52 million uh, for milling. This in turn leads to total operating expenditure of 19 US dollars per ton and total uh, capital expenditure of 72 million US dollars. So we now learned something about the estimation of operating costs, capital costs based on the life of mine, based on waste to all ratios, based on the mining method. Um, 
But uh, this is not the only decisive uh, factor for a mine because the economic criteria for quick appraisals are the operating margin, the payback period, the internal rate of return, and the net present value, which is usually applied to give a, cer a certain value to a mine. And we just do a quick uh, repetition of the operating margin. Um, the equation uh, est uh, estimates if mining and concentration of a mineral resource in the ground may result economic or not. So it's the ore value, the revenue, the net smelter return, minus operating expenditure, which give the operating profit or loss if it's not feasible. If this results in, a oper in an operating loss, we can stop the calculation because the mine will not be feasible anyhow. And here you can see an exemplary calculation of the operating margin of a mine. And in this case, um, we have a copper gold zinc mine with a copper grade of 2.3%, uh, a gold grade of 2.55 grams per ton and a zinc grade of around 5.7 percent zinc. Uh, by having a look on the prices you can see that this is probably a very old uh, example but on the other hand side you must not overestimate prices so you must not use actual prices but you should uh, take uh, let's say five year average prices to get a good idea uh, and not to overestimate uh, price peaks. So in this case, the copper price is 1.5 US dollars per pound. Uh, the zinc price is 70 cent per pound of zinc and the gold price is 925 US dollars per ounce. The project is planned to be an underground mine with a concentrator plant uh, and the operating expenditure is uh, assumed to be 70 US dollars per ton. And on the next slide, I will show you the calculation. Here you can see the different uh, price calculations for copper, zinc and gold. The metal grades are as uh, shown on the slide before. Uh, as we are using pounds, uh, we have a conversion factor which is 22.046 and we are assuming a net smelter return for copper of 65%, for zinc of 50% and for gold of 95%. The recovery is in the range of 80 to 90 percent and the metal price was already shown on the slide before. So if we now uh, multiply all these factors uh, we get an ore value, a net smelter return value for copper of around 42 dollars per ton of ore, for zinc uh, almost 40 and for gold um, 56 US dollars per ton of ore and this gives us a net smelter return for the copper gold zinc concentrate of almost 140 US dollars per ton of ore and we have an operating expenditure of around 70 US dollars so the operating margin of this mine is 68 US dollars per ton of ore. So the easy, easiest part uh, in the calculations we have is the payback period. This is the number of years that are needed to repay the investment. And it can be calculated uh, as the capital expenditure divided by the annual operating profit. In high-risk countries, shorter payback periods are required than in stable countries. The main reason for this is the higher risk of a mining operation to run into problems or it has to be shut down related to political changes, administrational changes, armed rebellions, expropriation, etc. And the opera may have then difficulties to pay back the debt. So the investor will require a short payback time, payback period in a less stable country, if you are in a stable country, the payback period will uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, very short. should be as short as possible, of course, 
but the, necess the necessity is not as big. Uh, this is a simple example of uh, how to calculate the payback period. Uh, so if you um, have invested 60 million US dollars and you have an annual operating uh, margin of 25 million US dollars, you simply have to divide 60 by 25 and it's 2.5 years. So this would here be the payback period as a very simple example. What you can see here is a little exercise regarding the payback period. So if you have capital expenditure of 90 million US dollars and an operating margin of 35 million US dollars, so what would be the payback period? So this is just a very simple uh, exercise and you will all know that the correct result will of course be 2.6 years. Mining projects usually have a value and uh, this value is mostly expressed as the net present value. This is done uh, to be able to compare uh, different mining projects in different jurisdictions with different grade and different tonnage. Uh, the net present value uh, takes into the account the time value of money. So in a potential investment project uh, there will be cash flows at many different points at time. And to be able to compare the different flows they must all be, be converted to a common point in time, usually the present day. And this is why it is called uh, net present value. And this is done by discounting the cash flow to the present value. So in this example um, you have uh, different cash flows at different times up to a year five and let's say that the cash flow is the same, always the same, uh, you cannot simply sum up all cash flows, but you, the, the, the cash flows in the future and also in the past will be discounted with a constant discount factor. So the cash flow that you have this year is then discounted by uh, without uh, a discounting factor because it's this year. Next year you use uh, uh, the discount, uh, discount uh, factor times n, n in years, and that means as you are discounting every year that the present value will be reduced every year the higher the, higher the um, discount factor is. So the net present value of, all, uh, of a project is the sum of all present values of all negative and positive cash flows that arise as the result of uh, realizing the project as uh, the result of mining and uh, selling uh, the end product, the final product. So the net present value is used to express the economic viability of a mineral resource project by discounting all future cash flows to the present. And it indicates whether a certain investment results positive in a positive net present value or in a negative net present value. And the net present value is calculated according the uh, formula you can see below. It looks a little complicated but actually it is not. It's just taking the operating profit, so the revenues minus the costs, and uh, these, this annual operating profit is then uh, multiplied uh, with 1 plus the discount rate. If it's 10%, it would be times 1.1. And then you have an exponent, and the exponent in the uh, case below is 1 minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and so on. It depends on the year. So in the first year, is it's the exponent is minus 1. In the second, it's minus 2, minus 3, and so on. And you sum up all the different cash flows. So at the end, uh, this gives you the net present value. In case of a discount factor of 10%, uh, uh, 
you would have a factor of around uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.91 after one year and after four years you would have a discount. Uh, discount. So in case of a discount factor of 10% uh, you would have a discounting factor of um, 0 0.91 after one year and after four years you would have to uh, multiply your operating profit with 0 0.68 so with every year that is more in the future further away um, the operating uh, profit is uh, discounted more and more and so it gives less value to the net present value and this is why companies try to uh, produce a high operating margin in the first years in order to increase the net present value because the money you make in the far future is uh, not worth too much for the net present value. In case of a quick and dirty um, assumption of the net present value as we have to do it, uh, as we do not have uh, so too many details, we have to do uh, some assumptions and one of the assumptions is that the annual profit, the operating profit, is the same over the life of mine. This is not very probable, but it makes the calculation of the net present value far easier. So in the frame of, a, yeah, as I said, quick and rough estimation, uh, the operating profit is the same over the life of mine. And by making this assumption, the equation of the NPV estimation becomes the following. So the net present value is the operating profit times uh, the present annuity value factor uh, minus the investment. You of course have to subtract all uh, the investment costs from the net present uh, f uh, from the net present value not, but uh, from the uh, discounted cash flows um, of all operating years. Here you can see an example of the calculation of a net present value of a mining project. So we take a life of mine of 10 years and uh, the mine has a cash flow so an operating margin of 1 million US dollars per year um, with a discount rate in this case uh, of 16% uh, and a cap capital market interest of 10%. Uh, so uh, you have in red the cash flow and in, in blue just on the right hand side of, of, of the cash flow the discounted cash flow over the years. And on the left hand side of the uh, graph you can see the uh, nominal cash flow before production, so the investment costs, which in this case are 4 million US dollars. But you also have to use the compounded uh, investment, so with the capital uh, market interests. Um, so on the right hand side you can then see the compounded investment is uh, added up and the same is done uh, with the um, discounted cash flow. So in the first year uh, you have around um, 900 million and in the last year there's not much left to, be, to add up as the discount rate is quite high with 16%. So without discounting you would have an investment of 4 million uh, US dollars and then on the other hand side you have a operating margin of 10 million so uh, you could say yes we have a profit of 6 million but in reality it's not working like this you are discounting the cash flow and uh, so this gives you at the end a marginal uh, profit a marginal net present value of only uh, 213 uh, US dollars and by discounting you do not have an operating margin of over the years 10 million but only 4.8 million uh, US dollars and on the other hand side you have to pay um, interest rate uh, capital market interests um, to the investment so you do not uh, have investment of 4 million but uh, of uh, 4.6 million
and that leads to a final net present value that is only 233,000 uh, US dollars, which is quite few for an investment uh, of uh, more than 4 million US dollars. We already talked about uh, this example given here when we talked about the cutoff grades and the influence of the cutoff grade uh, to the net present value. Uh, here you can see um, an applied uh, cutoff grade on the x-axis and the net present value um, on the other axis. So you see when you increase the cutoff grade but just narrowly over the over the first uh, low grades you can slightly increase the net present value up to a cutoff grade of 1.5 afterwards it's slightly decreasing but then uh, at around 2 2.53 when the cutoff grade is at that uh, or grade then the tonnage of the whole uh, reserve is rapidly decreasing and this has a big impact um, on the life of mine, on the tonnage to be mined and this has a very negative uh, impact on uh, the net present value. So uh, by increasing the cutoff grade you, over, over the first very small tonnages or small about the, the low grades you slightly increase the net present value but then when you really cut down a lot of tonnage uh, the economics for your uh, mine is reduced uh, as the tonnage of the uh, mining project is also uh, highly reduced. Here you can uh, again see what is happening if you're using a static mode for the payback uh, calculation and for the value uh, of the mine without considering the time value of uh, of the money so at the date zero when the when the investment has been done and you do the evaluation you just sum up the investment cost which uh, of course negative and then take uh, the operating margin over 10 years and so you would have um, a value of 6 million US dollars and by discounting the cash flow, you uh, have completely different uh, values. And these values uh, were shown um, in the example before. It's only 233,000 US dollars, a huge difference. The applied discount factor plays a major role uh, for the net present value. So generally, the industry uh, uses a discount factor of around 10%. However, the discount factor may vary considerably according to the risk of the project. And a discount factor for a mineral project comprises three principal components. First is the risk-free interest rate, which is around 2.5%. Then you have the mineral project risk, which can vary between uh, 3.0 and 16 uh, percent and additionally you have the country risk. You have low risk uh, jurisdictions uh, with 5.5 percent and you have very high risk uh, jurisdictions with 25 percent. So if you just take the risk-free interest 2.5, a low mining project risk of 3 and a country specific uh, discount rate of 5.5 you get the 10%. But this can uh, differ substantially and has, of course, an, uh, a very high impact on the net present value. And as it has a high impact on the net present value, it has also a severe impact on the project size and uh, the ore value you have to have for making a project viable. Here's an example of how much the discount uh, rate uh, impacts the net uh, present value uh, of a mining project. Uh, in this case, if you have, uh, uh, if you are not applying a discount rate, you have a positive uh, NPV of more than 200 million US dollars. Uh, by applying a standard uh, discount uh, rate of 10%, this goes down to around 90 million dollars, and um, 
at around 40 million US dollars, the net present value is zero. That still means that uh, you have a good project in, in this case because um, this the point, uh, the discount rate uh, is that high that the net present value is zero. This gives you the internal rate of return. And in this case, the internal rate of return would be uh, 40%, which is very good. But uh, you can still see how much uh, the discount rate is um, influencing the net present value. So if you are comparing net present values uh, in the same jurisdiction, in the same uh, uh, region, so you should pay attention that the same um, discount rate uh, was applied. And there's an additional thing to mention there. You can uh, calculate the net present uh, value before tax and after tax. And before tax, it's of course higher. So you also have to uh, be careful uh, to compare the same things, same discount rate, and either all before or all after tax. Uh, here you can see uh, what is happening uh, to the different present values when you apply different discount rates of uh, 2%, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 16. Uh, so uh, if you have a high discount rate of 16%, uh, the present value factor that is uh, used um, to reduce uh, the present value, the operating uh, uh, margin in the future, um, you can see that already after five years, only 50% of the operating margin is uh, translated to the net present value. And after 30 years, uh, it's almost nothing. Yeah? If you are able to use a very low discount rate, like 2%, you still put more than 50% of the operating margin you are creating in 30 years. More than 50% of this is still added to the net present value. So by applying a high discount rate, yeah, you are uh, you are you are losing money. So the contribution to the present value is very low. After already uh, five to ten years, almost to zero, when you have to apply a very high discount rate, when it's possible to use a low discount rate related to the mining risk and especially related to the country risk, uh, you will have a higher net present value. What you can see here are uh, different discount rates uh, for projects in different uh, exploration phases. So in the beginning you have exploration, then you go to pre-feasibility study, feasibility study, and at the end an operating mine. And uh, with all steps that are done towards a mining project, towards an active mine, uh, the risk decreases and so uh, does the discount rate. Uh, and you can also see that frequently uh, the discount rate for gold projects is lower than for base metal projects. Uh, one reason for this is that you usually do not have a problem in marketing uh, the, the end product. Gold uh, is like money. Uh, it's not a problem at all to bring it to the market. This is different uh, for, for, for base metals and that is why you have a higher risk for, for base metals compared to gold, and this is why the discount rates uh, for golds, uh, gold are frequently lower compared to base metal projects. Here you can see an example of a discount rate uh, for a project in Canada. You have the risk-free interest, 2.5%. You have the usual technical and economical risk, in this case 7.5%. Uh, and you have additional, uh, I don't know what this, uh, let's say two, one, one to two percent country risk. So the complete discount rate is around 11 percent. And on the other hand side, um, you have can have projects in, uh, I know Africa is a continent and not a country, but in the majority of countries in Africa, uh, you have the same risk-free interest you usually have the same technical and economical risks, but you have a higher country risk 
due to instabilities, uh, yeah, risks in general associated uh, with the country. And this increases the discount rate, which in turn has uh, very big impacts on the calculation of a net present value and on the mining project itself about the parts of the mine you can that are mineable and the other parts that have to be considered uh, a resource and not a reserve. What you can see here is the impact of discount rates, uh, rates on resources and payback periods. The higher the discount rates are the higher discount rates demand higher grades and shorter payback periods. Yeah. Um, you can see on the left hand side there the ore grades and uh, on the x-axis is the payback period. And if you have a very low uh, discount rate you can work with relatively low ore grades because it's not that important to have a very very short payback period. You can only create a very short payback period if your operating profits are very high and you can only reach that with high ore grades. So high ore grades are then reducing the risk as you will get your money back in a very, very short time. But on the other hand side, there are not so many ore bodies with, uh, with, with ore grades uh, uh, written here up to 4%. This is almost impossible. It's of, of course not completely excluded. You do have this, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as we can see recent, as, we, as we can see right now. But the probability is lower, and that means you have a lower amount of ore bodies. You probably do high grading, because you have to have high ore grades, this can destroy uh, um, the ore body or you probably uh, are only exploiting a very short amount of the ore in the ground. Yeah, you might have a very huge resource but it's not mineable, just 10 or 20 percent of the resource is mineable and that on the, on, the, on the long term has a very negative impact for the country because the longer the, you mine, the bigger the resources you can mine. Uh, the better for the country because then they get income taxes, they have employment over a, lo a, a very long time and skilled workers can be uh, can come out of this uh, uh, projects. Projects run uh, longer, you have more projects so this is all would all be advantages uh, uh, for a country but if you have a very high country risk you have high interest rates, high um, uh, you need uh, short payback uh, times and the discount rates then uh, destroy the net present value and so can they destroy the deposit. So here we'll give you a summary of discount rates uh, from the governance perspective. So ba a bad governance and the mineral resource sector and political instability in addition to its direct negative effects it always has in terms of mining, additionally reduces the benefits from countries on their resource potential. Possible mining investors uh, incorporate the country uh, risk as a key element in the discount rate for the project evaluation. And reducing the country risk would in turn help to improve the state revenues from mining and, additionally, improve the utilization of mineral resources, avoiding high grading, avoiding the destruction of certain deposits. An improved political framework of a country could lead to, the ch to a change of the long-term investment behavior. Yeah, it's not like coming in, taking out the money and running, aw running away, but then they could stay longer, they could mine longer. This is all profitable not only for the company but also uh, for the country itself and this should be kept in mind. Good governance reduces uh, the discount rates and a low discount rate 
increases the resource, uh, increases, uh, decreases uh, the mineable ore, and is in in turn um, very advantage uh, for the development of the whole country. We are now coming to the internal rate of return or IRR. The internal rate of return is a special case of the net present value. With this method the compound interest rate is determined where the net present value is zero. Yeah? So all the operating profits minus the investment result in zero. And uh, this equation can only uh, be become zero when the discount rate is adjusted. So if the internal rate of return is higher than the compound interest rate of an alternative investment opportunity, the investment in a mineral project is profitable. So the internal rate of return is when the net present value is zero. So you get uh, you you can, will come to this uh, point when you are modifying the discount rate uh, but as the development of the um, net present value is not linear um, taking different uh, discount rates you cannot use an interpolation between a low discount rate and a high discount rate but you uh, uh, really have to do uh, an estimation using the formula and uh, not do not by doing a graphical uh, determination. Similar to the estimation to the calculation of the net present value, we take the same assumption uh, here that uh, the annual operating profit of the mine is equal over the lifetime of the mine. And to facilitate the internal rate of return estimation, uh, we are assuming this equality of uh, of the of the profit, and making this assumption, uh, the estimation becomes a lot easier. The formula is then um, as uh, follows: so the present annuity value uh, factor is equal to the investment uh, divided by the annual op operating profit. So now we have uh, NPV, net present value, and uh, IRR, the internal rate of return. And the question is, uh, what should I use to compare mining projects? Uh, the net present value method allows to compare different investment projects uh, and to establish a ranking to select the best mineral investment opportunity for the investment, uh, investor. On the other hand side, the internal rate of return is a method that is not appropriate to compare projects, but it is useful to evaluate an, an individual investment. The NPV is, of course, uh, also not the only method that should be applied uh, to compare uh, different investment uh, projects. Uh, you can also uh, have a look on the on the on the re, um, on the uh, relation of the absolute investment to the net present value. This can also uh, be applied to see which uh, mining project would be worth an investment or should be taken or considered um, to be pushed forward to the next uh, development step. So we will now uh, see a concrete example. Uh, of the um, NPV determination. So what is the net present value of one mineral resource project which has a total mineral resource of let's just say 10 million tons and we do not calculate, we are just assuming a mine life of 10 years. Uh, the project uh, yields an operating profit of 25 US dollars per ton of ore and it requires a capital expenditure of uh, 60 million US dollars. So first of all we have a look um, on the annual capacity. This is very simple in this uh, example. So it's 10 million tons in 10 years. That means we have 1 million ton of ore that is mined and processed per year. And with the annual uh, operating profit 
uh, we just take the 1 million tons and uh, multiply it with 25 US dollars, which is the operating profit per ton. And we see that uh, we have an operating margin of 25 million US dollars. So the the operating margin is 25 million US dollars every year for 10 years. Using or applying a discount rate of uh, 10%, uh, this uh, results in a present annuity value factor of 6.152 over the 10 years uh, mine life on average. Uh, for the first year it's uh, almost 0 0.91 and for the last year it's less than 0 0.4 so the net present value is uh, then uh, not uh, 25 million times 10 years minus 60 but 25 uh, million times 10 years times 0 0.61 minus 60 so the net present value for this particular project would be 93.6 million US dollars. So the profit, uh, the project uh, is has a positive NPV. Uh, it would be feasible to invest in this project, and uh, well, a net present value of 93 million uh, over 10 years of uh, mine life and a very low, relatively low. Uh, investment of 60 million to the NPV seems to be quite positive for this example. On this chart you see the same uh, example, the cash flow and the NPV for a mineral project in uh, 1000 US dollars. So in the first uh, line you have the investment 60 million. Uh, we assume a revenue of 35 uh, million US dollars per year and operating uh, costs of just 10 million uh, US dollars. So the in this case the ore value is 3.5 times higher than the costs. And there's another rule of, of thumb that says if the revenue is twice as high as the operating costs then you have a profitable uh, mining project and this is the case here you have an operating pro uh, profit for 25 uh, million every year and then you have to subtract uh, the investment first and uh, then you have a um, resulting uh, cash flow you can see uh, on the on the line below and you have to of course you have to uh, apply uh, the discount factor for uh, a discount rate of 10%. You can see uh, after 10 years you uh, you do not add uh, 25 million to the net present value but only uh, 9.6 million. And the, on the last line you can see the net present value that is the sum of line 7 minus uh, 60 million 93.6 million in total so in this uh, base case scenario, you have a, you see that it's not very complicated to really uh, determine the net present value. You have to be aware that this is a very rough calculation as we use model costs, and we uh, assume that you have the same operating costs and the same revenue over the life of mine. But we cannot do uh, it differently because we do not have. Um, more exact, more detailed information about this particular mining project. If you have more information, more detailed information, you can simply uh, include them into uh, uh, this table, into this Excel sheet and uh, continue with your calculation. It would be more exact in, in this case, but if you lack this information, you have to do it uh, as I demonstrated here in this example. And now we will uh, continue with an exercise similar to what you have seen on the sheet before. This is about estimating the NPV, the net present value. So what is the NPV of an underground project which has a total mineral resource of 7 million tons? Uh, 
a mine life of 10 years uh, yields an operating profit of 50 US dollars per ton of ore and requires a capital expenditure of 90 million US dollars. So now the task is to calculate the NPV with a discount factor of 10% and to use the PAV factor table or simply sum up the discounted cash flow as you could see uh, on uh, this sheet before. So you can now put all these data into the Excel sheet cash flow for a mining project and there you can uh, see what is uh, the annual profit, what is the costs, you know that, what is the depreciation over time and so on and so on and you should start to play around a little with what is happening when the, you have a high royalty, what is happening if you have uh, taxes, higher taxes, lower taxes, all that are uh, influencing factors on the project and you should just take the data, play around, play around with the discount rate, what is happening. So uh, this, this would be important to get more insights about what is really influencing a mining project. And you can simply play around with these data and I'm sure you can learn a lot uh, by doing that. So what are the objectives of a fast-track evaluation? Uh, applying this, we are able uh, to assess a deposit or a project with limited information available. We can do a quick ranking of projects according to expected economic outcome on the basis of key parameters like grade and tonnage uh, using model costs. 
a transformation of a project idea into, into a broad investment proposition is possible also in a very early stage. We can highlight the principal investment aspects of a possible mining uh, proposition, but it is not suitable for the calculation of an absolute profit, as a lot of variables like infrastructure, availability of workforce and a lot more variables are not included, as we only have a very limited information. We are not able to do an absolute um, calculation of the profit, but what we can do is to produce a ranking of projects and compare them to each other, or uh, also in, an, in a quite early stage uh, of uh, project development. We are using roots of thumb and model costs, and this makes it possible to see whether a mining project might be feasible or if there is absolutely no chance and we can skip our, all the efforts on this project and we can focus on a project with a higher probability to proceed further and to eventually become a mine in the future. So if you are doing estimations about the economic viability of mining projects, what is of uh, yeah, most importance is the ore value, the life of mine, operating expenditure and capital expenditure. And these are all input parameters uh, to estimate the economic viability of a mineral resource project. And the criteria, so the operating margin, for example, the payback period, the net present value, and the internal rate of return express the economic viability of a mining project. And important are the economics of mining and milling, so the operating margin, and of course also the economics of building and operating a mine and mill. So at the end, the net present value. So let's come to another exercise. As a geologist of a national mining authority, you are working on information packages to promote the development of several mineral resource projects in your country. In order to decide with which projects are the best to be further developed, you have to assess the economic viability of mining and concentrating the resources of the mineral projects presented on the next slide. And what you need to do is to calculate first the net smelter return, then you have to calculate the life of mine or in other words the daily capacity of the mining project and you need this daily capacity to give a proper estimate about the capital expenditure and the operating expenditure. And only with these data you are able to calculate the operating margin and the, comp the total investment. And if you take this information and put it into the cash flow for a mining project slide, Excel slide, uh, then you can play around with these. And then you can insert the tax rate, you can uh, add royalties, you can play around with the depreciation, you can play around with the discount rate. And then you know what is really influencing these projects and what is not so important probably but if you are comparing all these uh, different projects then please take the same taxes take the same royalties take the same depreciation take the same discount factor as long as these projects are in the same jurisdiction if you're in a different jurisdiction you of course at least have to change uh, the discount factor, which is highly influencing the net present value. So on the next slides, couple of slides, you will find information and tasks and you should try to go through these data and try to do your own calculation in order to apply what you hopefully have learned in the last couple of hours. So thank you very much for taking your time. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you could learn something, take away something, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate 
and contact me. You will find my uh, information on the very last slide. And just contact me and I will try to give you a hand, try to help you out uh, if there's something remained open and I'm sure there is. Uh, and probably we can uh, go through the task together. Thank you very much and goodbye.